Welcome to uh, the second webinar from the Smiles Consortium, where we'll be giving you an overview of the precise approach. Um, and just to say, I am Tue V. Jensen. I'm from the Technical University of Denmark. I'll be hosting and uh, taking you through our webinars. So I see a couple of names that I recognize from our previous webinar. So just to pull up the main takeaways from that webinar is that the simulation tool chains that we have when we're doing these energy system research simulations are highly individual. And they differ largely in scope and scale and purpose. And the other thing we saw was that there is great potential in combining different approaches. And we indicated, for example, that if you're doing national scale scenario planning, there might be an interest in including some local multi-energy system concepts within your national scale scenario planning. And so, so given this kind of broad background so that we're doing energy system simulation and we see that there's a large diversity of tool chains, a natural question is, is how do you begin to combine these tool chains? For example, if you have a district heating system and an electricity system and you have these simulated in very different ways, one group and another group, then how can we transfer knowledge between these different approaches? Um, how could we communicate effectively and efficiently with experts who might not be in our specific domain? And how can we make our simulations reusable, shareable, and reproducible? Where, of course, the last one is one of the, the main hallmarks of science. What we're hoping to do today is show you a bit about how we attack this issue within the consortium, how we experienced all of these issues that might come up here, and how we developed a method that helped us to overcome these issues and allows us to actually achieve what's on the slide here. So first and foremost, I wanted to say a bit about who we think you are. So for our last webinar, we spoke mostly to PhD students and early career researchers. And we're going a bit broader with this one. And we're saying we think you are either an academic in an interdisciplinary project. You need to work between domains, between different tool chains, between different research groups and especially between different areas of expertise. And you need to combine them in order to achieve some simulation that you're looking to do. On the other hand, we think you might also be a professional who's working with simulations. You need to plan or design or develop or operate a system or a simulation. And you need to combine many different expertises to actually get there. You might have a heating component that needs to talk to an electrical component that needs to talk to and so on. So I want to start by saying, well, what are some specific issues that you meet when you're in this in these areas? And I want to point out a couple of specific benefits you can you can obtain with the precise approach. So the first issue is that interdisciplinary communication is hard, which I hope is self-evident to anybody who's ever done interdisciplinary uh, work. Uh, just an example, you can say, well, if I say the word controller. Do you then think of a human operating a machine, either directly or indirectly? Do you think of an algorithm for turning measurements into set points? Do you think of an implementation of an algorithm in some programming language or some embedded controller or something like that? Do you think of a physical unit, so either a computer, embedded controller, or something else that runs that implementation? Or do you think of the action of that physical unit together with the units it's controlling? And depending on who you're talking to, you're going to get very different answers to this question. And you're going to get very different interpretations even within the same answer of what a control actually means. And this extends more broadly to the domains of electricity system, to the domain of heating system, and so forth. The second issue that we face is that we need to manage turnover. In academia, that means we have many short-term contracts, you have postdocs, you have PhDs, and so on coming in and out of a group. And in industry, you have some more reliance on short-term contracts and reliance on, on contractors and general competition for staff. So one of the issues you have to manage is not only is interdisciplinary communication hard, you want to be able to onboard the people that are coming in as quickly as possible. So the real question is, if somebody comes in, where do they start with the simulations? And even worse, if somebody leaves, then how do they leave behind the knowledge that they achieved within the course of their working with you? The precise approach, in addition to allowing us to, to talk more generally about simulations, is trying to tackle exactly these two issues. And it does it in two ways. Basically precise, a two in documenting all aspects of simulations. 
It has two main aspects here. It does that by discussing aspects independently. We'll get into this more later. But uh, basically, it separates the purpose of the simulation, the input for the simulation, and the implementation of the simulation. It's especially designed for cross-disciplinary teams, and one of the big benefits is that it makes some of the assumptions you have about your system explicit. Further, because it's a documentation of uh, all aspects of a simulation, you can use it as an onboarding tool. You can essentially give someone a description of a simulation in the precise framework, and they'll be able to learn from that and, and figure out exactly what the simulation is doing, how it's doing it, and so on. You can use it to build a repository of existing knowledge, and if somebody's already documented something in a precise approach, you can leverage that work to build your own simulations based on it. So for the webinar, there are two main sections. The first section is going to be a general overview and introduction of the precise approach. We'll look into the different aspects of it. And the second section is going to talk about how we in the project have implemented the precise approach, some of the main takeaways we've learned from it, and some of the highlights of using method in, in our case. And then finally, we'll go into summary and questions. And a final thing I want to say before we get started is that we're going to be presenting this method as one monolithic process and documentation. But in practice, we actually find that it works pretty well if you take a portion of the method and you apply that portion at the time when that portion is useful for you. So if you need to discuss a specific component in your model, it might be useful to just document that one part of the component. You don't need to go into the full precise approach description. Please keep in mind that even though we're going to show you all the parts, we find that you can actually take the parts and use them in a modular fashion. And with that, let's get started on the methods. I will start by giving you the overview and the initial bit of information on it. So the precise method in a nutshell separates three main things about your simulation. It separates the why, that is the purpose and the goal of your simulation. It separates the what, that is your simulation inputs or some other portions of your simulation internal description. And it separates the how, which is all the toolchain specific implementation. So at the end here, you're going to have a tool chain that you put all these inputs into and that you fold your purpose into and you end up running and you end up doing data analysis. We're not going to get much further into that here uh, and because that is very tool chain specific. So if you're looking for ideas on how to do the how part of the precise method, we refer you to the first webinar we hosted on the topic. In each of the boxes above the why and the what, there are several different components, and the remainder of the webinar will go through all of these components and try to give an idea of what's contained in there and why do they exist in the method. First, in the why, you have a test case. That's a combination of a use case, a generic system configuration, key performance indicators, and an objective function. And we'll fold those out in more detail and talk about why they're in there and what they do. In the what, you have a combination called a test specification. Here you have a specific system configuration. You have some input data. You have some component models and some control functions. And by combining these, you are able to describe your simulation in a way that is independent of your toolchain. And exactly that independence is important because that means when you describe the why and the what separately from your toolchain, your simulation description is not tied to the specific tool chain you choose. And independence is a main keyword here because our method is threefold independent. The why is mostly independent of the fact that you are doing a simulation. So that means you can take a why that you've described in the process approach and you can apply it in other contexts. For instance, you can apply it to a real-life experiment. You can apply it to a discussion that you're having without needing to build a simulation. Likewise, the what is mostly independent of how you intend to put your simulation into a computer. And so what that means is you can take a why and a what, you can take them together, and then you can put it in different tool chains. And we'll show you an example at the end of the webinar of how we've done that in the project. Finally. You have the how, and even though it's toolchain specific, it's still independent of the why and the what. 
in the sense that using the same approach for putting something into a toolchain, you can decide to change your why and your what and still apply how you built the how. And so given these three independencies, you get a separation between the different parts. You get a separation from the tool chain. You get a separation from even from a simulation in, in the first place. And this analysis of your problem allows you to precisely document what is happening in each portion. The most fundamental thing when you have a simulation here is talking about the why, because in the end, the reason you're doing a simulation is not why, because you like doing simulations, typically, anyway. It's typically because you're intending to achieve something. And the thing that you're intending to achieve is the use case. And the use case essentially says, what is the intended functionality of your system? To whom is it valuable that the system has this functionality? And typically, a use case is formulated as a thing the system does when it works in the intended way. That is, we don't talk about how does the simulation work. We talk about what does the system do, given that we've developed it and we've put it in the real world, and it's running perfectly. And the idea of a use case is to try to encapsulate the why in one sentence, after which the other sections of the why can be expanded upon in other sections. So as examples of use cases, these are actual use cases written by partners of the project. You can talk about having grid-friendly operation of conversion and storage appliances. You can try to coordinate the operations of district heating and electrical power system. Or you can have a market-oriented operation of conversion and storage appliances. And so really, in this one sentence, you get the broad scope of what is your simulation trying to show or do or evaluate or design or plan? What is the reason that the simulation exists? And so in order to document that, the precise approach gives you a template with several textual description forms, covering, for example, the intended functionality, that's the formulations you saw before. You need to specify some of the related actors. If there's an electrical storage that you're describing, then you have to say a little bit about what you expect that electrical storage to look like. And especially there are uh, sub-objectives in there. For example, if you describe a use case that has to do with the district heating network, then part of your sub-objectives might be that the district heating network runs within temperature bounds. So you don't get boiling or freezing water, for instance, in the pipes. The thing about a use case is it's a bit weird to talk about an abstraction because I've been saying a lot of component names here, electrical storage and district heating. So a use case always contains an implicit system of some kind. There's always something behind there that is doing something. Describing that section of the precise approach is exactly the topic of the next presenter. I will hand you over to Peter Falgering from b 2 energyville and uh, he'll discuss how system configurations work in the, uh, in the context of a precise approach. You introduced it already, so thanks for that. So the talk was uh, called Mapping a System Configuration. The first thing I would like to do is to specify what we mean with a system configuration. Ah, you already gave the hints, so it's the, the static parts, you could say, of a simulation experiment description. And in a bit more detail, you could say it's a detailed technical description of an energy system, a list of energy domains, electricity, heat, and so on, system components, interrelations, such as connectivity and hierarchy, and the inherent properties of the components. So it's quite a long list. Important to mention also they're independent from use cases. Also, as two is specified, there are multiple use cases that could be run, say, on a system configuration. Uh, that's one. That's actually the main topic I will discuss in a couple of minutes. Then there is also a, a complementary feature, uh, which is very much related to the topic of upscaling. So those who have attended the last webinar probably remember that's also one part of the SMILES project. Uh, for that element, to understand how system configurations and use cases could upscale in a larger scale energy system, it's, it's very important to understand the particular context a system configuration is embedded in. And there are different factors, and we use uh, a well-known framework from scenario analysis to capture social, technological, environmental, economic, and political factors. 
I will briefly come back to this in the end uh, of the talk. All right, so here's an example. So this is one of our system configurations. It's called Collectopia. Uh, you can imagine it being located in the north of France in a rural area. Uh, what you see here are a couple of elements. There are buildings. Here is a central building. It has thermal active foundations, has uh, decentralized energy storages. There is a district heating network here in red. There is a greenhouse. Uh, capturing heat and the residual heat is used in the heating network. There's, for example, uh, aquifer storage to cover seasonal storage. So there's and there and there are many other elements that I I haven't mentioned yet. So the question is, how do we systematically map such a system? So we could give you the diagram yeah, or a long list of all, all the elements, but we thought we uh, we could do a little bit better. So before actually designing the system configuration description form, we started from a number of design requirements. I want to go over all of them, but just a few. For example, uh, editing flexibility. Uh, yeah, that basically means that we wanted to keep it flexible. So that, for us, implied that it needed a more or less qualitative description of the different elements, connected also then to uh, numerical descriptions in the form of machine-readable data. Also important was to have some kind of modularity in the description, so not to, to have a, a long list, say, but to kind of reduce it into main blocks in uh, some form of a lo logical modular or. And that, uh, in the end, resulted in a template which contains a number of different main categories. There's a general description. There is what we call a system breakdown. This I will show in a minute showing the elements uh, in the system config show machine. And then uh, there is the topic of the interactions, say the, the connections between the different elements. And there are two levels. So there is the graphical representations, say the network diagrams and so on, to show that. And then there is also the more precise description of all the different connections in the system. And finally, there is the elements descriptions, which means that all the elements within the system breakdown, which are initially portrayed on a graphical level, need to be described in each individual detail. So again, connecting to Tua's introduction, the generic part is rather the upper boxes of the, of the template. And then the specific one is in very much into the elements connections and the elements descriptions. Yeah, time is too short to go over all these different elements. I think the one which is most kind of interesting to look at here for, for this brief introduction is the system breakdown. So what you see is that we included it in a modular and a kind of a hierarchical way. System configuration of Colletopia would then be on the first level subdivided into the, the four main component blocks district heating infrastructure, buildings, electricity infrastructure, and the management system. And then from each block, you zoom in on, say, sub levels. For example, in terms of the buildings, there are three types single houses, office buildings, special buildings, and so on. So if you remember, what, what we saw in the picture that I showed before, for example, the greenhouse would be located right here. So it's part of the buildings group, special buildings format in the greenhouse. The aquifer storage, that would be under the district heating infrastructure, uh, centralized storage, aquifer storage. And for example, the PV on the houses would be under the electricity infrastructure, decentralized production and PV. And as said before, the real detailed description of all these elements is then provided in the remainder and the other parts of the system configuration. So some last words on the steep context. So as I said, the question is, in what kind of context is the system configuration embedded? And in this case, it was embedded in the, in the northern French context. And we have been doing interviews with professionals, say architects, for example, uh, dealing with this type of local multi-energy network to understand better what are the factors based on which such a local multi-energy network could upscale on energy system national levels. Yeah, we distinguished the five different types of factors, social, technological, environmental, political, and also kind of two main levels within that, the really local level and then a more national level. So for example, relevant social factors are the awareness among professionals about, say, the benefits and the possibilities these types of technologies, 
economic factors would, for example, be energy tariffs, which are adopted in France and the types of distribution tariffs and so on, and heat tariffs. Oh, an interesting one there is the political one. So the system configuration very much relies on collective use of underground heat source, and there's actually no regulation about such uh, collective usage of the underground heat. So that's something that would need to be developed. On the local level, there are other factors of importance, like community feelings, which can be very important to collectively manage. Such a system are important. They are generally stronger in rural villages than, for example, in big cities. And also, in the economic factor is relevant there, as there is some level of economic decline in that area, and then the development of such networks is considered important to revitalize the area. That's my introduction to the system configuration, and then I would like to hand over to Benedict to further discuss the test case. My name is Benedict Leitner, I'm working at the Austrian Institute of Technology, and I will now go into more detail of what we do with the precise approach. We already heard about the system configuration and the use case, and I will now talk about how we, for example, quantify the performance of a system or a component in the system. We normally use key performance indicators for that. So you might have the total costs for district heating. Um, this is obviously an economic key performance indicator. It describes thermal networks. You can give some kind of calculation how you calculate the key performance indicator given your simulation results. So we use this example to have a formal description of key performance indicators to not only deliver the calculation, but also some meter information about the key performance indicator. So a textual definition of the KPI, the name and the context where it is used, the group and domain to which it belongs, a clear definition and a mathematical formula to calculate it, also some insight into the data requirements that you have to be able to calculate this key performance indicator. So for example, the expected data source, the collection interval of the data and reliability of the data that allows you to calculate this KPI. Another thing that you regularly use uh, in describing systems is an objective function, um, so something that you want to optimize for the system. This might be the total costs for heating and also maximize the consumer comfort. So you might have your objective function that combines the two and tries to minimize the total system costs and also, for example, a room temperature deviation from, from a reference. So basically, the objective function combines two key performance indicators and tries to, to optimize them. Again, we tried to set up a documentation form or description form that allows you to describe your objective function, uh, including all the meta information, the name of the objective, the context also described textually, the group level and the domain where it is used, the intended use of the, the objective function, the mathematical formulation and calculation, what kind of optimization it is, is it linear, is it mixed integer, and, how to, and also the uh, most important constraints that come with the objective function. We see that the key performance indicators and the objective function somehow coupled or tightly connected, and we use this conceptual breakdown of the optimization problems into these three are used in the objective function and an optimization method, which is already something that might be full chain dependent. And using this conceptual breakdown between the three parts increases the modularity and flexibility of the formulation of such an optimization problem. So we are now able to uh, define a test case given the system and the use case and the key performance indicators and objective function. We now want to test our system. So for example, we want to characterize the self-consumption of photovoltaic generation for a local energy community. So this might be our test case. The system configuration might be 
uh, multiple buildings with the heat and the power demand and TV generation. The use case being that we want to increase the use of local photovoltaic generation using power to heat. We quantify this with the KPI being power export of the community, and our objective is to minimize this power export. So basically what the test case now does is that it asks the question, why do we combine the use case, the system configuration, the KPI, and the objective function? And it glues those components together and gives us a, a detailed idea of how we can test the system performance given its expected function. But until now, the test case is an abstract idea and we have to further specify this test case. This is done in the test specification. And the test specification further specifies what we are actually considering. So how the system looks in detail. For example, the specific system configuration. Until now, we only had an idea that there are some buildings but now the specific system configuration specifies that there are five buildings. Uh, the buildings have this and that heat demand with this and that input data. For example, load profiles or weather conditions are given. The buildings are uh, described using this component model. And for example, the power to heat units are controlled by this model predictive controller that is documented in the control function. So what the test specification does, it further details the test case and it defines the means and methods under which the test case is carried out and evaluated. And I will now um, give you an idea of what we uh, do with the component model description form. So basically consider that you have a detailed model of a heat pump that includes submodels for compressors, evaporator, valves. And you may not now want to pass this model over to a colleague that has a very similar uh, simulation tool and wants to implement your heat pump model. Or you want to hand it over to a colleague that uh, wants to optimize the size of the heat pump and basically uses an optimization algorithm for that. So, a completely different approach. And you can now use this uh, component model documentation form that documents the component model again, toolchain independent to describe your model in every detail and also toolchain independent again. So basically you classify the model, you give an idea of the intended application, you give an idea of the model dynamics, is it continuous, is it quasi static, you give the governing equations of the model, you specify the inputs and outputs, the variables and parameters, uh, the initial conditions. And what's also important in the component model is that there are test cases for the component model that basically give you, for example, for the heat pump, uh, heat load profile, um, under which this model is being tested, and you also provide the results for this test case so that your colleagues then can use this test to have a reference under which they can uh, basically test their own model implementation in their simulation tool and compare their model implementations. So basically you can use this documentation form for the components to document your model, toolchain independent, and your colleagues that receive this model description can use the model description form to understand your model, to implement it into their tool chain in a way that it is still comparable to your model implementation. So at the right graphic, you see on the top an example for a tool chain that is very similar to your tool chain. So if the recipient also has a detailed uh, simulation model for a heat pump, and it now wants, wants to validate his model against your reference test case, then he will go for this model validation and use your test result to validate his model. Or you'll have a colleague that does optimization, which might be different to what you did in your simulation tool, and your colleague is fine if the model is basically harmonized against yours so that it has 
similar results, but of course, maybe not with the same level of detail as, as we already saw in the example I gave for the heat pump. Maybe only a, a simpler uh, linear model that is able to be used in an optimization problem. This was basically uh, my part, and I prepared a short question. The question is, what distinguishes a test case from a test specification? Consider there might be more than one correct answer, but there might also be only one correct answer. I'm glad that the majority answered the question correctly. The test specification adds detailed means and methods to the test case. And I hand over to the next presenter. Thank you very much, Benedict. So the last thing we need before we have a complete test specification, in other words, a complete description of our simulation without saying how we are going to simulate it, is the last part of the what, which is input data and control functions. And I want to look at what these two differ, just to disambiguate the two terms. Because the input data is the exogenous influence in the system. Typically, they are time series, or system unit parameters, or topology and connectivity, or the simulation metadata. In other words, it's all the things you change when you want to perturb your system in different ways. Control functions, on the other hand, are endogenous system behavior. And it's that part of the behavior that's not captured by the unit models. So if you have a radiator that has a thermostatic controller that is local to the radiator, you would probably put that behavior inside your unit model or component model. On the other hand, if you have a building energy management system that, that tracks an entire building, you would probably put that in a control function instead because it's easier to discuss at that level rather than having a component that is the entire building plus all the radiators plus and so forth. And particularly important is the idea of an implicit control function. These are common in optimization models and I'll come back to that later. So input data, well, what is actually input data? Well, at a very basic level, input data is either time series, where you might have a time series that gives you the production of a wind turbine over the course of an hour, or it might be topology, where you specify which lines are in your system, where are they located, what are the parameters, and so on. So you might have an electrical system topology, a district heating system topology, and so on. And once you have these described in this way, you can then build a parser that puts them in your simulation software and runs the simulation with them. In order to document input data, we start by saying, well, there are several different data formats. There are both generic and domain-specific formats. For example, there is an IEEE format for describing an electrical network, which is fairly extensive and very widely used. But one issue we had with giving that as a recommendation is that there are certain types of input data it doesn't really handle. For example, how do you write down all the scenarios for the load that you have inside this data specification format? It wasn't built for it, and so there's some information that is, is difficult to kind of squeeze into that format. So we set about trying to find something that can handle the breadth of systems encounters in energy systems modeling. And we required that the data format we choose is human readable. It should allow for metadata. In other words, it should allow to say something about what the data is. For example, are you talking kilowatts or megawatts when you have talk about a power? It should be self-documenting in the sense that once you get the data file and the metadata, you should be able to read all that and just understand what the data is based on that. We, we target medium scale data sizes. So that means we're talking maybe 10,000 rows of data, not millions and millions and millions of columns. And finally, it should be computer readable with a broad software support. Examining these requirements, looking into that, we went out and looked at some of the, the common data formats. You can see the table on the left. And the takeaway from, from this examination is that there's basically no single data format that fulfills all the requirements. But you can build a combination of data formats that captures the requirements quite well. And so what we chose to say in the end is that you use .csv files for raw data because they are very nice for documenting time series, for example. They're very human readable. And you use .xml files for metadata, 
and we'll come back to how that looks when we put it in, in the precise approach way. We find that that combination has a good readability for humans, and if we compress it in a zip file, it's a single file that you're sending around. It's not a, a giant cluster of files, and so that's what we chose. These are also nice because there is high degree of library support for these things in many different platforms and programming languages, and there are standard ways to read and write to these files. One major caveat is that there are performance issues in very large data sets, but because we're mostly targeting medium scale data sets, we saw that as less of an issue as opposed to having a very human readable file format. One example of an input file that you might make is a buses.csv that describes some buses in an electrical system. You would then put the information on the left in a CSV file, so you have bus 1, bus 2, bus 3, and so on, and some uh, defined columns. In a, in a separate file that we call manifest.xml, you then write down, well, what is in that table? So there's a table named buses. There's a textual description of the buses here. And then for each column, you specify what is the description of that column, what is the minimum value, the maximum value. And if it makes sense, you put a unit on it. So you might put kilovolts, for example, and say that's the units of that column. And together, these two files allow you to very concisely describe a data set in a way that's self-documenting and human readable. And at the same time, because it's an XML file, the file allows you to parse this XML file and build a web page, for example, using that data. So that's how we chose to handle the exogenous data, so that is data that influences our system some way. And it's also how we chose to put structural data, like which buses are in your electrical network, into uh, data. But the simulation is given by more than just the exogenous input, so our perturbations, it's also given by system response. So that's given by the component models that you saw before, the interactions between these component models, together with the exogenous input data, and finally, the control functions of that. Documenting the control functions turns out to be a much more tricky task than we thought it would be when we started the project. One particular thing we found is that there are basically two types of control functions. One type is an explicit control functions. It, you might have a functional description that says, I take some inputs, and here are my outputs, and then those outputs get, get sent to units, and the units act according to those, and so on. You might have rule-based or state machine-based uh, control systems, or you might have an optimization or model predictive control strategy for how you implement your control function. And in all these cases, that's an explicit control function. It's one that you can easily identify, and you can point at and say, here are the inputs to my control functions, and here are the outputs. As an example, if you have this thermostatic building controller that takes temperature measurements from control over a building, and then the integrates various radiators around in order to try to keep the temperature stable, that is an explicit control function. The tricky part comes when we come to an implicit control function. Because an implicit control function is one that is embedded in the system behavior, the component model, or even in the way that we actually simulate the system. For example, if you have an optimization model, you would typically write a constraint that says something to the effect of the energy being produced by the generators in my system have to be consumed either by losses or by consumers in the end. And so that power balance equation is actually an implicit control function, because somehow, some way, your system ends up in a balance, but it doesn't specify exactly how that happens, what the actors are, which, which sections of the, of the system talk to which other section in order to achieve it. It just says, well, there is this implicit control in my system. And so if you have a simulation that has implicit control functions, you have to be very careful about how you write these control function description forms, because otherwise something might be missed, such as, for example, the power balance equations. And energy systems typically don't function very well if there's not a power balance in the system somehow. In order to describe these functions, and we try to, to really squeeze the forms in order to be able to describe implicit control functions, you would first describe the purpose of the control function. So which use cases are associated with it? In other words, what is it achieving when it's just out there controlling a unit? You would then write down a structure, inputs and outputs. In the case of an implicit control function, that would be typically a combination of inputs and outputs, so a balance between inputs and outputs. Uh, and then you draw an abstract implementation 
and particularly for implicit control functions, so that's typically a mathematical formulation where you simply write down the constraint in your optimization problem that contains that implicit control function. And together, these allow you to describe it and they allow you to talk about it. And in particular, they allow you to make choices about how you are going to switch from an implicit control function to an explicit control function and vice versa. And so in summary, uh, the input data that we give you and that we define here is .csv with XML files in a zip file. And they are sufficiently flexible to self-document while allowing a wide range of input data to be defined within them. And our control functions are specifically designed to try to represent implicit controllers and allow you to extract those implicit controllers. And so we've now given you all the elements and a flavor of each element. Hopefully, this isn't too much information at once. But the idea is that's a method in a nutshell. You have a set of forms that you use to describe either the what, why, or the how. And together, these form a complete description. And they allow you to document and leave behind when somebody leaves. And they allow you to take them back up and use them to get somebody new on board with a simulation quickly. But OK, so that's a lot of information, and it's a lot of uh, specifics. So what I would like to hand over to now is Shisha Wu, who will talk uh, a bit about how we actually tested this method on ourselves. OK, hello, everyone. My name is Shisha Wu. Uh, now I'm going to present to you about the precise approach in the real world and demonstrate to you how we use this precise approach to document the simulation and how it is applicable to a broader context. And here, as previously introduced, the precise approach was developed to share the information of the interdisciplinary energy system, especially among the partners with incompatible modeling paradigm or tool chains, to verify that this approach is uh, feasible and useful. We conducted several cross simulation among the partners, SmartDolf, Collectopia, and FlexOffice, and SmartFlag, and Nohan. Uh, besides, we also did a test case to refine our description of why and what. With this test case, we implemented three different how with three different tool chains from AIT, DTU, and KIT. And AIT used a co simulation approach, rely on functional mockup interface specification. And DTU used the Mosaic co simulation framework, and KIT used MATLAB and Simulink for the simulation. So this is our test system. Uh, the system configuration is like the left figure, and it's a simple multi-energy system consists of electrical and thermal domain. And our objective here is to optimize the size of this heat pump. Although we all model the same test system, our three different model departments, but there are still differences in our implementation in our respective tool chains. To compare our results, we identified three different levels of details from the test, the time series, key performance indicators, and objective functions. The analysis of time series result is the most detailed one, but actually we don't need that lot of knowledge about this dynamic behavior of the signals. So we aggregate the information and define the set of key performance indicator to describe the main feature of the system. So in the test case, there are three KPI we defined, and we simulate the system and, and uh, uh, analyze the difference of the KPI. After all, uh, we also combine the KPI into an objective function. And this function is what we actually want to minimize or maximize. So we neglect this time-independent information, but get the overall performance. In the test case, the cost function is used to find the optimum size of the electric boiler. So for this cost function, we want to minimize it in our three different tool chains. As can be seen, the difference of the optimum size is uh, still have some slightly difference. But we can consider the result from the three different institutes are pretty comparable. And the description form we generate for the test case is roughly tool chain independent. So we can also use this approach as we did for the test case in a larger system, like for the SmartDolf and the other cross simulation. 
the test case is just an example to show that the approach is valid, but we still want to use it for a larger system. So here we take SmartDorf as an example. SmartDorf is a fictional village or one part of a small town with structure typical for a rural area of Austria. And there are a small number of residential homes, office, and workshop inside. The cross simulation here is conducted by EDF and AIT. The purpose is to combine the two approaches from uh, AIT and EDF. So the tool chain of EDF is to design and find the optimum size for the electric boiler. And the AIT tool chain is to implement uh, and evaluate the op operational uh, performance and the technical feasibility of the system. So in the workflow of the SmartDorf, first the AIT extracts the necessary information from the SmartDorf study case and send it to EDF. And EDF implements this uh, information and produce the uh, optimization of the electric, uh, electric boiler size and send it back to AIT. And then AIT uses this size to adapt its implementation and run detailed simulation. So uh, what benefit did AIT and EDF get from utilizing precise approach in this case? It supports the realization of the cross-simulation in two ways. First, it provides an intuitive separation of the most relevant part of the system. Uh, for example, the control function, the system configuration, and so on. And this allows the partition of this smart of the complex system into a smaller and easier understandable way. And second, the exchanging of data using SMILES format enables the exchanging of the data in a more readable and defined way for both machine and human. That's my part for introducing you how we use the cross simulation to test the feasibility and usability of our approach. Thank you, Xiao. So in summary, we used the precise approach and we showed you a bit about how it separates the why, the what, and the how of a simulation. And by doing that, we allow you to modularly and completely document your, the simulations that you're running. We've tested the feasibility and the usability within the project. We've shown you one example cross simulation and one larger scale, but we're conducting several others and you'll be able to access them. But in the end, all we're really giving you now is just a lot of facts and there are templates and you can fill them in. One thing we're doing as well is to make a software platform to help you along. So they assist with filling in the temp definitions and the templates, assist you with workflows for both documenting and disseminating data. This software platform is also going to act as a repository of use cases, system components, input data, and so on. So for all the partners here, we are all going to put our simulations into precise form and put them on the software platform. If you use the software platform, you'll be able to download all of that data and apply it in your own simulations in all these ways. And the major benefit here is that it will allow you to apply the FAIR principle to your simulation to make it findable, accessible, and reproducible. And so watch this space. We will let you know when this software platform is coming on. Thank you.